All right. I want to go through a little bit about the germ theory of disease, um, some of the historical perspectives of the germ theory of disease, and also um, culminate with Koch's postulates, which are an important part of um, germ theory of disease that we will use in this class to help understand better uh, agents and how they cause disease. So the germ theory of disease, if we want to really summarize it um, quickly, it's that specific microorganisms, microscopic organisms, are the cause of specific diseases. And, and you might hear me say this and think, well, that's a really funny thing to say. Of course, small microscopic organisms cause specific diseases. But this idea is relatively new um, in terms of science. It was only developed around um, the, eighth, the late 19th, early 20th centuries um, when we could finally say for sure um, that small organisms were what caused specific diseases. So what did people think before they thought microscopic organisms caused diseases? Um, that would have been the humoral theory. And I'm telling you this just to give you some historical context um, for disease. So Hippocrates, um, in around 460 to 370 BCE, um, developed, um, uh, as well as many other thinkers, developed this idea of a humoral theory which um, posed that the human body contained four humors. You might have heard, um, you know, talk about this in, in some of your readings in humanities classes, um, but the idea that you had four humors, um, black bile, which is melancholy, yellow or red bile, which is cho choleric, uh, choleric, um, the sanguine, which is the blood, and the phlegm, which is phlegmatic. Um, and so you can see that, you know, they think, well, these are four types of um, feelings that people could have. Um, and their physical health and their, their attitude, their mentality, um, was reflected in the balance or the imbalance of these various humors. Um, you know, that's, that's fair enough. They sort of looked at what they, they knew about the world and they tried to understand it. But then how would they treat someone with disease? Well, they assumed that they had um, more of one of these humors than they should. And so they would try to rebalance those humors by um, getting rid of excess of whatever humor they thought was causing the problem. And from this is where we get practices such as bloodletting, where blood was removed, um, thinking that getting rid of blood would help cure uh, whatever symptoms were being observed. Now we now know, you know, that, that this was not really, um, you know, the cause of, of infectious diseases at least, um, but this was a start to sort of thinking that there was some bigger thing going on in the body um, when diseases were being seen. So actually, you know, not very far after, um, you know, the, this idea of the humoral theory as it developed, people did have an early germ theory that they developed. I mean, this actually was present for hundreds of years prior to, you know, the middle of the 1800s. Um, people had this vague notion that there were tiny organisms that floated through the air and they caused disease. Now. They didn't understand this in the same way we do of, of microscopic organisms that cause disease. Um, they really thought that these were like invisible animals that snuck up on them. Maybe they were mythical sort of animals, things you couldn't see. Um, in the context of, of what they knew, you know, the explanation didn't make sense, but it was sort of, um, you know, something that they could, they could use to explain how sickness happened. Why did people in the same house get sick? Well, there must have been this thing flying between them to get sick, um, even though it sounds a lot like the germ theory we know, um, when people thought about it, it was really much more like um, the cooties theory that you probably remember from elementary school, where you can get cooties from someone else if you don't get vaccinated um, with your cootie shot. So how did we start breaking down this idea of this animacular theory? What kinds of things were um, damaging to developing an understanding of germ theory? And one of them was the idea of spontaneous generation. So spontaneous generation is the idea that organisms can just arise out of the environment they're from. So when you think about disease, when you think about you know the types of environments in which you find disease, you can easily see how those bad environments might cause um, disease to occur. For example, the disease we now call malaria was thought to just arise in um, swampy areas because there was bad air in those areas. So by breathing the bad air, you got the disease. The disease was a function of that area. It arose out of it. Um, Francisco Reddy um, was able to disprove this theory with this famous experiment that you've possibly seen before. Um, and he was able to show that 
maggots do not come from meat, um, from rotting meat, as many people thought. So many people thought that when meat was sitting out rotting, it just turned into, by spontaneous generation, maggots. Um, so what he did was he put a piece of meat into three different flasks. One of the flasks he left completely open, the other flask he completely sealed, and the third flask he covered with a piece of gauze. Now, he saw in the unsealed flask exactly what you would expect with the rotting meat. Little maggots um, grew all over it. Now, in the diagram, it's showing you flies, but you can imagine that when you observed this experiment, you wouldn't have seen the flies, you would have just seen the maggots. Um, what was important about Reddy's experiment was that when he sealed the flask, he saw no maggots inside. So that answered the question of whether the meat could spontaneously turn into maggots, and it was not able to because the flask was sealed. I think the most interesting part of his experiment was when he covered it with gauze. Um, the flies were still attracted to the meat and they laid their eggs on top of the gauze. So the maggots appeared on top of the gauze rather than um, on the meat. And so he was able to finally put two and two together and figure out that the maggots were actually the, the immature flies after the flies laid eggs onto the meat. Um, these types of experiments continue to follow and they weren't really settled um, for another couple of centuries. Um, by the work of Louis Pasteur in the 1870s. Um, this is, you know, a very famous experiment that shows um, spontaneous generation does not occur, especially um, in light of microbiology. So if he took um, growth media and boiled it for a very long time and it killed everything inside of the tube, and with this very specially curved tube that he looked at, air could get through, but microorganisms could not. They would be trapped inside of the tube. So after several days, and in fact for a very long time, no microorganisms would appear in that solution that he boiled because they were all trapped up in the neck of the tube. If he took the flask and tipped it on its side, so he allowed those guys to fall in, those microorganisms, suddenly his tube was full of microorganisms that were growing there and he was able to um, show that you know these organisms needed to be present in the broth for the broth to become full of things growing in it so it was not spontaneous generation it, it had to come from something else um, from these experiments came the idea that you know these seeds or spores were what he first characterized them as Floating in the air were necessary for the growth of microorganisms, and the seed or spore idea is where we get the word germs from. Um, so this is why we call them germs. They're tiny seeds or spores um, in, the, in the first characterizations that travel through um, the air and can get things sick. Um, so we now know they're not actually seeds, they're, they're microorganisms, and the, the final piece of the puzzle that I want you guys to know is the work of Robert Koch, um, who did this work on microorganisms and actually earned a Nobel Prize in 1905 um, for developing this work and developing what we call Koch's postulates. Um, so he did this while studying Bacillus anthracis, which is the causative agent of the disease anthrax. And he found um, four postulates. His first postulate is that the microorganism must be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease, but it should not be found in a healthy organism. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. If an organism is sick, it should have some causative agent that's causing that disease if it's an infectious disease. The second postulate is that you should be able to take that organism and isolate the microorganism um, from that diseased organism. Um, the way you would isolate this is perhaps drawing blood from that organism and spreading it on a culture plate, um, a plate that has media um, suitable for growth, and you should see um, whatever pathogen is causing the disease growing on that plate. His third postulate is that once you get that disease growing outside of the body, by putting it into another organism, you should cause the disease in a new healthy organism. And the fourth postulate is that once you get that sick organism, the second sick organism, you should be able to once again isolate the pathogen from the organism and culture it. So this process should be repeatable showing you that a tiny living organism is what's causing the disease. Now this diagram you can follow down the pathway of the disease animal. He's able to isolate the pathogen, culture it, put it in a new mouse, and isolate and culture it again. On the other hand, a healthy animal, when he um, pulls it out from the microscope, he doesn't see any suspected pathogens, 
um, and no pathogens grow on growth media. So this is cooked postulates. If a, or if a disease is caused by a microorganism, that microorganism has to be present in the, in the sick organism. You have to be able to grow that, um, that organism in culture and then get another organism sick um, with that. Um, that said, Koch's postulates actually um, have some problems with various types of diseases and pathogens that we'll be looking at in this class. Um, they're not perfect, but they do give us sort of a fundamental um, model to think about when we think about infectious disease. Koch himself had some problems with this because um, there are examples of organisms that we would call a healthy carrier. Someone who has a disease, um, you can see the disease in them, but they never get sick themselves. So then you would have an otherwise healthy animal that does indeed have the pathogen present in them. We'll learn, um, when we learn about some of our microorganisms later this week, that some microorganisms can't be grown in pure culture. Viruses would be a great example of this. So by Koch's postulates, viruses would not be a causative agent of infectious disease, but we know um, that that's not true. Um, and they're, they're no longer then, because of some of these problems, used to demonstrate causality in a laboratory setting. So no scientist takes a new disease and makes sure that it fits all of Koch's postulates. Um, but they all understand Koch's postulates as sort of a, a foundation to understanding how disease occurs. So I hope that helps you understand you know, where we come from historically when we think about the germ theory of disease um, and, and sort of the, the very basic understanding that we need to have of an infectious disease if we want to indeed call it an infectious disease. Uh, this should be important for you to think about as you begin studying your various neglected tropical diseases in this course.